The Bob Murphy Show, episode 295. you gonna do get ready for another episode of the bob murphy show the podcast promoting free markets free minds and grateful souls it's your source for commentary and interviews conducted by a christian and economist now here's your host bob murphy hey everybody welcome back to another episode of the bob murphy show again just the hits keep on coming. This show just keeps getting better. I mean, I certainly think so. Hope you guys agree. Today, my guest is Christian Hubs, and he's going to be going over some of the strongest evidence that we have for why the historical figure, this so-called Jesus of Nazareth, actually was crucified, died, buried, and came back from the dead. I don't know that Christian's going to make the case that he came back on the third day, but definitely that there was this guy walking around. He was killed. He was dead and came back from the dead and a bunch of people saw him. Okay. That's what Christian Hubs is going to be making the case for. Now let's give some of his background here. You might think, oh, he probably doesn't know how chemistry and physics works. He sounds like a fool. Well, Christian Hubs holds a PhD in machine learning and optimization from Carnegie Mellon University, an MA in Christian philosophy and apologetics from Biola, a Master's of Science from ETH Zurich, and a Bachelor's of Science from The Ohio State University. He currently works as an independent consultant and researcher in developing and applying AI machine learning solutions for business. And their uh, website for what he's got going on is at redsynth.net, so R-E-D-S-Y-N-T-H.net. A uh, little bit of the backstory, so Christian... I think he's been a supporter of the podcast um, and is in the uh, the special secret group at MeWe, and you too can get involved if, you, if you'd like. Just go to bobmurphyshow.com slash contribute. And when I had my episode on William Lane Craig versus Christopher Hitchens, the, the first one where I went through and was... Uh, reserved in my praise for William Lane Craig, Christian mentioned, you know, in the chat or whatever that, Hey, hey I actually met William Lane Craig and think he's great. And maybe, you know, Bobby, maybe he dove into his arguments too quickly here, but you know, he's a blah, blah, blah. Okay. And by the way, I should say the more I've uh, seen William Lane Craig in other contexts, arguing with cosmologists about different models of, you know, expansion of the universe and things like this. And, the multiverse and blah, blah, blah. He's arguing, we're well, not arguing. He was on another show with a sympathetic uh, biologist arguing about origin of life research and things. I mean, he, William Lane Craig is extremely intelligent and has a very deep level of knowledge in many fields. Okay. So uh, I still stand by what I said you know, in my review of him that for, for the for his opening statement against Christopher Hitchens, but I'm just saying that, that he's, he's a more formidable thinker than I appreciated at the time. So anyway, that's what happened. And then Christian gave me a, a video of a sermon he had given at a, at a church where he went over some of the evidence for the resurrection. And I thought, this is great. Come on the show. So here we are. My conversation with Christian hubs, Christian, welcome to the Bob Murphy show. Hey, thanks for having me. So I would have already explained in the intro that people listen to a little bit about why you're here and how that happened. But for people who skip that stuff, can you just explain you know, what your background is and why you're knowledgeable in the topic that we're going to be addressing, which is the case for the resurrection of Jesus? Yeah. So um, I have an MA in Christian philosophy and apologetics from Biola. Um, uh, I also have a doctorate in uh, from Carnegie Mellon on computer, computer science and, and whatnot. So I've been in the academic world for a while, but um, I wound up, uh, you know, getting involved in apologetics uh, before heading off to, uh, to to grad school. Um, 
just because I knew I was headed into a fairly hostile environment for my faith, and I wanted mm-hmm. to you know try to understand a little bit more about it um, and see if there and really do some some serious investigation. So I started to read a bit more um, before heading off to, uh, to to school and found out, hey, I love this. So um, after I actually did my first master's, I went and did a second master's in in apologetics because um, I was like, wow, this is a really fascinating area and a great. Um, space to, to be in, something that's really intellectually stimulating, and uh, provides a lot of good um, foundations for my uh, for my faith. Okay, great. And I know William Lane Craig is associated with Biola, but was, did he teach there? I should know this, but I don't. Uh, he did. So he didn't teach when I was there. So I okay. was actually doing it um, via distance. I was living in Holland at the time. And so okay. I was uh, doing it online and then flying out to L.A. Um, so there were a lot of other professors, and he would come and talk um, during the summer sessions on occasion and so forth. But um, I did have some um, – I did do his uh, – was a reasonable faith chapter director for a number of years in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, and so I was involved uh, with his ministry at that point. Okay. All right, great. And then – and you you, you said you, kn- you know him personally? Yeah, yeah. I mean – probably doesn't remember me we've met on a few occasions yeah. had dinner I mean, it's or what's not that. Like he calls you up and goes golfing with you every other weekend <laughs> right yeah okay so that's that's an interesting connection because again folks that's it, it the connection here is that i my posted my remarks on william lake craig well, that was when he was debating hitchens right the one yes. that you said okay yeah so um okay so having gone through all that and then let me just mention that uh so, so where i'm coming from so people don't get confused is i am a christian but I spent a good period of my life as an atheist, and I and I was not. People say, "No, you're agnostic," and I was like, "No, I'm an atheist in the sense I don't believe in Zeus." That's what I mean. It's not that I'm agnostic about whether Zeus exists. You know that that was my stance. So yes, I know I can't prove blah 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 blah. But anyway, I was very dogmatic, um, and so and now I'm a Christian, and so I'm going to. I think the best way to let Christian make his case, and then the the service that this episode will provide to the public is to put it through the wind tunnel, right? So that I will try to, you know, stop you, Christian, and say, well, wait a minute, what if somebody says such and such? And so, again, folks, just in case you're not familiar with me personally, I'm not doing that because I think Christian's wrong. I'm doing it just to make sure the argument is as strong as can be and to deal with possible concerns people might have. Okay, so with all that, how do you want to start, Christian? Yeah, I mean, we can just jump in talking about, you know, some of the motivation. I mean, uh, I'm sure in the intro we discussed a little bit that um, – you know, we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And so for Christians, this is absolutely central to, to our faith. This is what basically everything hinges on. Because Christianity is rather unique in the sense that it posits that something happened in history. Mm-hmm. And there's a historical moment that changed everything. And that's the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. So when I started getting into this, I was just really surprised at how good the evidence is that you can actually argue for it. I had uh, grown up in a Christian household, and I had assumed that uh, essentially you just, hey, you just, the Bible says it, so that's good enough, never really questioned it, and then started to dig into it a little bit more. But, um, you know, can I stop you, Christian? Because what you said was very profound a minute ago, and I, I just want to make sure we don't gloss over that. That, um, and, and this might be news to non-Christians or even Christians. I was raised Catholic and some of this stuff, I'd, it was just so complex I didn't think about it, but um, I, I think you're right, Christian. There's a Someone might say, what's the big deal about whether Jesus, you know, isn't it enough that he had, you know, probably there was some guy with some wise sayings, love your neighbor, you know, that kind of stuff, let him who was without you know, stone cast, or without sin cast first, and I know that is controversial that maybe, you know, that's some say that that wasn't in the Bible, or that that didn't happen. Um, so you could see it from that point of view, and to say just like, does it really matter in the grand scheme if he fed five thousand people with a few loaves or not? Isn't it the important thing of his moral teaching? Mm-hmm. And so, for someone who's thinking like that, like they're trying to be accommodating and you know, let's all get along with everybody, they might say, what does it matter whether he? died and rolled it because that seems kind of like a mythical thing like God, come on like, I didn't he didn't die and it was nailed to a cross and then he came three days that's clearly that that can't be real but that doesn't detract from the the contributions of Christianity to Western civilization blah, blah. I can imagine someone saying that but like you're saying like Paul for example is crystal clear that no 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 if Jesus didn't die and come back from the dead then it's not that we can continue on with his good teachings yeah Absolutely. So uh, one of the verses that 
we can point to to motivate that. It comes in 1 Corinthians 15. So Paul right here says, and I'll, I'll just read it real quick. Um, he says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have also fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people to be most pitied. So I think that's pretty profound. And, and for those who haven't heard that before, just to break it down a little bit, Paul's making this argument, and, the, and we'll come back to this passage a little bit later. He's making this argument about the resurrection and about what he had learned about Jesus and the tradition that he had received. And he says that essentially, if, if this isn't true, we have nothing. We're misrepresenting God, so we're lying about God. We're being held to this incredibly high standard of uh, moral perfection in Jesus that we can't attain. Uh, and we're trying to live this life that is basically, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's useless. It's, it's futile. It's worthless. We're in our sins. We're, we're lying about God. We're, we're trying to do all the right things for the wrong reasons. We have nothing. We have no hope because Christ hasn't been raised. So just straight from Paul, he, he's very clear about this, that if, if this didn't occur, then Christianity is bunk. There's nothing to it. And we ought to be most pitied of all people if, mm -hmm. if we hold on to this and the, and the resurrection didn't happen. So it's absolutely central for Christian faith and belief that the resurrection occurred because without it, there is no Christianity. Well, yes. And just to elaborate or extend that to make sure people are getting the issue, what I'm trying to get across, because this is, I think, I think how I would have thought back, even though, again, like I said, I was raised Catholic and then had a period of what I thought was devout atheism, but it's it's not merely that, oh yeah, this guy Jesus is alleged to have um, performed a bunch of miracles, he walked on water supposedly, he was transfigured, he did the, he raised Lazarus from the dead, and then he was here, here I got a Christian, this is what I'm trying to get my put my finger on. If it turned out that actually they made up the fact that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, like suppose everything else in the Gospels were true, but that part we somehow conclusively proved was added later and you know some people mm -hmm. just made that up because it sounded like something jesus would have done but actually that didn't happen you know that would be alarming because then you wonder well, what else in there isn't didn't happen but strictly speaking okay christianity could survive that but if it turned out that jesus didn't die and raise i mean that like you say that's it's not just that he was a guy that did some cool miracles it was that he died for your sins so if he didn't die and come back then that part goes out and so christianity is not merely a bunch of precepts for for wise and good living like the you know it's central that there is this guy that took his sins upon himself and died and and you're cleansed because of that right absolutely yeah and and so if that didn't happen again there's no Christianity where it's more than just a moral teaching. It's, it's, it's belief in a person and his actions and namely his resurrection as vindication of his claims to, to divinity. And so without that, we don't have anything. So you know, getting into some of the evidence in the way that um, I think we'll just break it down is just kind of focus on three points today, uh, because I think there's a, there's a lot more. Sorry. I hope I'm not being obnoxious. Let me, I think, because I, I know what you're going to say here, like in terms of your case. I would like to jump ahead, though, and deal with somebody who's saying, why are you, like, it's a matter of, of faith. You know what I mean? Like if the Holy Spirit's not working within you, it's pointless. You know, some, somebody who, who's a naturalist or whatever, they're not going to hear it. So why are you even going down this path, Christian? Yeah, so I, I think that you hear that from some Christians. It's a it's a view called fideism. So essentially, that faith alone is is all you need, and any kind of arguments or evidence to the contrary is only or serves as a reduction in faith. And so you're weaker because you need it, or or something along those lines. I've I've heard these similar kind mm -hmm. of statements before in the past. That's kind of what you're getting at, right? So that, that well, right. That I'm saying from a I can imagine a, a, a yeah a, a Christian saying that. Well, well you. You, you have it on both sides that both the Christian and the skeptic can say, what is the point of this little exercise you're going to go through? And so from the Christian, if we handle the Christian one first, the yes, to say you're, you're, you're given too much credit, you're, it, among other things, well, you're by putting all your weight on the historical evidence and this and that, what it could go the other way. And so mm -hmm. isn't it was more important to talk about faith, you know, that, that, 
Yeah, and, and you can absolutely, you don't have to have evidence to have faith, but I do think it's helpful, and I think it's something that Christians should actually strive for, to, to be intellectually involved with their faith. And you, when you read the Bible, uh, I mean, gosh, there's... um. Uh, Peter Bogosian, I think, y- y- are you familiar with him? He um, yeah. he was involved with the grievance study hoax. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, right. Mm-hmm. So he had done, I had come across him about a decade ago or so, because he had uh, put out a number of different um, books. He's a, he's a militant atheist and talked about faith and other things and how um, faith is belief without evidence. I don't think that's actually true, <laughs> that right, it's belief either. without evidence. You can have a lot of evidence, but to actually put your faith in something is, is you know, is actually to, to take actions uh, based on that evidence uh, or lack thereof. There, there might not be any, but you're still taking actions as if you believe something, and, and that's what it means to, to, to put your faith in it. That's a, an example that this chair can support me that I'm sitting in. Um, you know, I, I, I can believe it, but I don't actually put my faith in it until I put my butt into it and, and ensure that it's actually um, able to support me and I can get all the arguments and so forth for it. Um, so that's kind of what, what faith is, and evidence can support that, and it can help somebody cross over that threshold um, from from unbelief to belief by having that faith. And it's helpful when uh, Christians might uh, come under attack or come under pressure. There are times when you know, our faith might not be as strong as we would like, and to be able to uh, point to the evidence and recall the evidence, it's, it's a way to, to help bolster it. And moreover, I, there's a good biblical precedent uh, for Christians to appeal to faith. Uh, Paul does this frequently. Um, a, a famous example comes in Acts when he's preaching in Athens uh, about the uh, and using the philosophers uh, of the Greeks and the Athenians and quoting them and providing the evidence there uh, for the for uh, Christianity and saying, hey, this is the kind of stuff that you guys are after. You want faith. You want proof. Um, or sorry, you want evidence. You want proof. And here it is. And is it, Paul, yeah, Christ, a minute ago, you said there's good biblical case that Paul appealed to faith, but you meant to say appeal to evidence. I think. Sorry, yes, I meant okay, appeal yeah, to evidence. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, Peter does the same. Uh, again, you look at a lot of these um, sermons that are given throughout Acts. They often appeal to what people have seen, particularly when they're preaching in Jerusalem. You have seen this. You know that this occurred. You, you saw these things. You saw Jesus, his death. You saw his life, and we're proclaiming him resurrected. Uh, so they appeal to a lot of the evidence that people have on hand in order to uh, convert them, in order to get them um, to, to work with them uh, such that they may believe. Okay, great. And then the flip side is you could imagine a skeptic saying, what is the po- the stuff you're trying to es- to establish here? is so off the wall off the, you know you're off your rock or crazy that a priori i know there wasn't a guy it, i don't need to sit here and listen to your case well no there's six separate witnesses and blah 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 <laughs> and therefore the logical inference is that some guy walked on water and could like come on give me a break like there's that element yeah oftentimes you'll hear skeptics and atheists advance this uh, in terms called uh, sagan saw right extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence mm-hmm. uh, when you actually it, it sounds convincing at the beginning right when you when you first hear that uh, but i don't think that it's actually true when you think about it i mean well first off what is extraordinary evidence what what does that mean does it mean it glows right. or something or <laughs> right. yeah that, that's good point you're right because I, I was okay with that when i was refereeing the debate between hitchens and William Lane Craig, but you're right. Like, what would it even mean to say evidence is extraordinary? Right, that is highly improbable, and or or, or what would that necessarily mean? And and you can think there, in the news today, there's a lot of discussion about say aliens and UFOs and so forth. Um, but nobody's requiring extraordinary evidence for that. We're looking for normal testimony, and we're looking for normal uh, video footage or, or what have you uh, in order to establish that. And a lot of people are now saying, hey, I think aliens are real because of the testimony they've seen, because of some of the, the uh, UFO footage that they've seen and so forth. This isn't extraordinary evidence. You might need more of it. You might need additional evidence or more evidence, but still ordinary evidence. It just um, to believe you know something that's improbable, you might need some additional um uh, pointers to it, uh, but it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's extraordinary. And so I think we can look at a lot of the normal historical evidence, the textual evidence, the archaeological evidence, and so forth, in order to be able to establish a case for the resurrection, a, a case for uh, that that points in that direction. Okay, yeah. So you're okay with like a reformulation to say something like, for an extraordinary claim the burden of proof or the threshold of evidence is higher than for a more ordinary claim. 
but it doesn't mean the type of evidence you provide would have to be qualitatively different. It just maybe you would need a higher quantitative amount. Yeah, potentially. And that's also going to differ person to person. Some people mm-hmm. are going to be more, um, uh, have, have a lower bar to adopt something or, or to change their worldview. They might be predisposed to it. Um, other people are going to need a lot more evidence in order to take on that same belief. Yeah. I, I just mean like if, you know, someone goes in the police station and reports and says, yeah, I saw this guy two blocks away shoot somebody, they might take down the statement. Okay, well, he'll send some detectives out. But if you say, I saw him shoot somebody with laser beams that came out of his eyes, you know, then you, they might not treat that claim the same. So I think that's what that saw has, you know, where it comes from, what they're trying to get across. But, but fair. But as you're saying, like, or we could flip it the other way, just say, suppose Jesus really did do these things. How would we ever, you know, if you're if you're ruling out using historical analysis and testimony, what else would we do? We can't. It's not like there was a satellite that was in geosynchronous orbit at the time that we can just go check the infrared footage from that. You know what I mean? So right. it's sort of like, what else could we do to see if that did happen? Unless, so unless you're just saying at the outset, no, a priori that did not happen. End of story. Well, okay, then you just admitted evidence won't work on you. Yeah, exactly. And and you see this sometimes when people they. Um We'll say, well, if, if there was video evidence and so forth, and I'm always skeptical of that. It's like, okay, so if there was a video camera, we know that videos can be doctored and can be altered right, right. and so forth. So imagine that that was the case. I'm sure then you would say, okay, well, if there was some DNA evidence, if there was some, you know, you can always ratchet up the, the right, right. level of your skepticism um, if you don't want to believe something or don't want to accept it. Okay, so I kind of interrupted you. You were getting ready to lay out. Did you say there were three main lines you wanted to go through? Yeah, just to keep it um, parsimonious for, for, the, for the day. Um, you know, the three, I, and we can add to this, uh, and there's some great resources I can point people to if they're, if they're interested in reading more. Um, but I think we'll just focus on uh, the empty tomb, post-mortem appearances, and the rise of the church, particularly the fact that it's in, in Jerusalem, as evidence um, that points for the, the, the resurrection uh, of Jesus. Mm-hmm. So... Um, as we talk about historical evidence and trying to establish the historicity of an event, especially when we're talking about ancient history, uh, there's archaeological evidence and textual evidence um, by and large. And the archaeological evidence is great for a lot of stuff, um, but it really doesn't give you the full context. You really need the, the textual evidence. And in the case of what occurred in ancient Palestine um, at this time, uh, most of it is going to be textual evidence, and you can find some um, confirmatory archaeological points. So uh, in the Gospel of Luke, for example, um, there are many uh, names of rulers and places and so forth that historians were skeptical of because they never found evidence but this has been vindicated over time through archaeological finds that where they see inscriptions of, of um, pilots or so forth and, and, and other um, historical figures that are mentioned. Uh, but by and large, yeah, most yeah, of the I evidence gonna is going to... say, Christian, do you know, was that relatively recent? Because I, I thought when I was younger I had seen claims saying we don't even have evidence that there was such a person as Pontius Pilate. Yeah, so I, I, it, I might be mistaken on this, but Pontius Pilate, I think, is also mentioned by... Um, Philo, uh, the, another ancient writer, um, and Josephus. But there was another, there was a certain title that I think he had that um, was unique within the Gospel of Luke. Uh, then it was later found maybe 15 or 20 years ago. I'd have to double check and, and mm-hmm. look. Um, but I think that there, there's a title that, he, that uh, Luke gives him um, that was actually found in an inscription, and they thought that was unique to Luke, that he got that wrong or made that up, but it was actually mm-hmm. later vindicated. And that was fairly okay. recent. Yeah, I think maybe that's what I'm... Th- inter- so, I do know I saw people, just like even to this day, if you see arguments on Twitter, people will confidently tell you, we have no evidence there ever was a Jesus of Nazareth. You know what I mean? Which is kind of like, it's goofy. But yeah. anyway, um, so I'm, but I, I knew that, yeah, there was something of where it was more recent, that there was some new discovery to say, oh, wait, yes, it had to do with Pontius Pilate, but maybe, yeah, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. And, and you, you, you do find Jesus mythicists uh, out there as well, as you, as you mentioned, the people who deny the existence of Jesus. Uh, and I, th- it's on very, very thin ice. Uh, it's basically um, three or four scholars, people who have actually studied this um, in the world who actually hold to that view. And they're very, very fringe. Robert Price, Richard Carrier, and um, there's another guy in Australia that's, uh, that comes to mind. Uh, but it is more popular um, amongst the laity, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You know, your, your typical um, 
atheist on Reddit or Twitter or, or, or so forth. And, and to be honest, it's just, it's just not something that the evidence bears out that Jesus didn't exist. There's plenty of evidence, not only it, what we find in the Bible, but there are also extra biblical um, evidence for him that we see in Roman writers. Uh, Suetonius, Tacitus referred to Crestus um, or, and, and uh, to his followers and so forth. Um, Josephus refers to him a couple of times, who was an ancient uh, Jewish historian who, who wrote about the time um, and was uh, lived shortly thereafter. Um, and, you know, he, he was a Jew. He wasn't a Christian. He wasn't, you know, uh, supporting Jesus, um, but he does mention him. And so we have a, a number of different evidence and lines of evidence for, for his existence as well. Um, and, but most of this comes from textual evidence. Jesus didn't write. He doesn't have any uh, statues or inscriptions that, uh, that date to this time. Um, his tomb isn't marked, Jesus was here, or anything along those lines. Um, it, it does come through this textual evidence. And so that's primarily what we'll, be, what we'll have to focus on. Okay. Um, now, what, what's this, is this weird thing I've noticed sometimes where, I don't know that anyone ever comes out and says it, but you get a sense, like certainly like Bart Ehrman or whatever, where it's almost like, well, if you're just getting that from the Gospels, then it doesn't count. You know what I mean? So I, I understand you, you can't take them as the inspired word of God if you're trying to do this sort of naturalistic, like, mm -hmm. hey, let's just see where the facts lead us kind of thing. But on the other hand, you shouldn't just ignore the existence of all these manuscripts, right? Like, that's not nothing. Like just right. because a group of people think that they're holy or inspired, doesn't mean well we're you know that they're off bounds and you can't use them. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's an important point uh, because that's where I think a lot of people um, get a little bit lost in the weeds if they if they haven't thought about this as uh, these as historical ancient documents and ancient documents um, or you know it's, it's just they're, they're documents there's something that's um, happened and historians can look at these and try to understand you know whether or not something is true within the text that's given uh, we have lots of lots of these that you know people realize okay hey not everything that was written about Alexander the Great was true um, it, but there are no there are no Alexander cults in existence today or or, or anything like that um, but they realize that there's some myth and so forth and you can also approach the, the gospel text um, in, in the same manner, the New Testament text, as a collection of different authors and different writers who wrote at different times and from different perspectives, sometimes using different sources and so forth, um, in order and try to bring those together to have a more complete picture of what occurred. And so historians will use different approaches um, to establish whether or not something is actually historical and different criteria. So uh, multiple independent attestation is one. So this is where if you have multiple sources that are saying the same thing, it more, it's more likely to have occurred. Um, embarrassing details, if you admit something embarrassing about yourself or about the faction that you support, it's more likely to have occurred the not. Why would you be making that up? Um, enemy attestation, and this is where um, if there's somebody that disagrees with you and they also um, agree on, the, or maybe not somebody who disagrees with you, let me rephrase that. If there's somebody who's against your position, but they agree on the basic facts, then they will, uh, it, it provides further support that that actually occurred. So to give an example, let's imagine that uh, we got into a fight um, mm -hmm. I, being both pacifists, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But um, let's just put that aside and imagine that we actually got into, into fisticuffs of some sort. So if there are multiple people around who say, hey, yeah, we saw those two actually throw throw blows, um, it, and we, you know, we bring this to court, there's evidence, multiple witnesses say, yeah, Christian hit Bob, Bob hit Christian, so forth, um, it's more likely to have occurred, right? It's pretty straightforward mm -hmm. if, if you have multiple witnesses all saying the same thing. Uh, now, if... You know, we, we discuss the fight, and I say, yeah, I hit him, um, but it was really his fault and so forth. Uh, and you say that uh, I hit you as well. Then now we have enemy attestation because we're, um, you know, arguing against one another. We have different positions on in, the, in, in trying to get this sorted out. Um, mm -hmm. But we both agreed that I hit you. You know, and uh, if I just to make sure it's an obvious point, but just because it's quick, it, this is it's such common sense. But so, folks, again, what he's getting at is. If what we're trying to determine is was there act, you know, down the road looking backwards, was there really a, a physical fist fight between Christian and Bob? And he's saying, well, if we have all this court testimony from different people who said it, and then we have the testimony of Bob and Christian, and Bob says, yeah, he he hit me for no reason, and Christian gets up on the stand and says, oh, I hit him, but it was because he said insulting things about my mother. It's the question of did Christian punch Bob is 
you know what I mean? Like that's whereas if Christian said no, he's making that up, and these people who have testified thus far are a bunch of liars, then you you might be more in doubt. But if he agrees that he did it, and we just argued about why, you could be pretty sure that yeah, this this really did happen. Okay, sorry, just yep. I wanted to spell the obvious. Yeah, absolutely. And then the other one is is embarrassing details. If I say you know um, I hit you and. Uh, you know, um, because you made me cry or something like that. Like that's going to be, you know, right. embarrassing to look bad mm-hmm. for me. But you know, I admitted it. Right. Or like, and I had wet my pants, and he pointed it out to everyone, so I had to hit him or something. Yeah, like right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It, it's 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 like why would you, why would somebody make that up? Um, mm-hmm. Why would you why would you add that detail unless it was true? Right. Okay. So now we've got the framework, and then do you, do you want to now apply that to the resurrection? Yeah. So okay. You know, with that in mind, we can go and look at those three points that I laid out: the empty tomb, the postmortem appearances, and uh, the rise of the church. And um, I'm not sure for people. Maybe we'll have to fill in a little bit on some of the details with the Easter resurrection story as we go, um, in, in case anybody's not familiar with that. But uh, the basic outline of the story is that Jesus was um, brought to trial. Um, for for blasphemy by the Jews, and they turned him over to the Romans because the Romans actually had authority to execute him. Um, through through the trial, um, a- afterwards, they decided, okay, Pilate decided we're going to execute him because um, the crowd wanted it, so they brought him to the cross, crucified him, and then he was taken down and interred in a tomb. Um, and then three days later, the his some of his uh, female disciples came and... Um, found that the tomb was empty and were told uh, by an angel that he is risen. They went back and reported it to the uh, to the other disciples and so forth. Um, so that's kind of the general outline uh, of what occurred. So um, the first line of evidence that we can point to is, is looking at the empty tomb. So what's important to, to consider with this is that um, this all occurred within Jerusalem. It was discovered by women. It also has enemy attestation uh, and multiple attestation because we, we find it in all of the Gospels and in Paul's writings. And there's no veneration of, of the tomb. Um, and we actually have good evidence for where it is today. Um, so looking at each of these in turn, uh, you know, to provide support for this, you know, first point of the empty tomb, um, as I said, every gospel writer has some sort of version of the resurrection with an empty tomb. Um, we also see this in the first Corinthians 15, which is what I read a little bit of earlier. Um, but earlier in the passage, Paul writes that he was buried and he was raised. Um, this implies an empty tomb. The other thing that's significant about this is that this is the oldest Christian creed. Uh, a scholar James Dunn, in, in particular, places it within about 18 months of Jesus' death and resurrection. So it's very, very early. Uh, you'll even find skeptics like Bart Ehrman saying this is the earliest uh, Christian creed and so forth, uh, saying that it, ha- it may have popped up within a year or two, five years, maybe max, of the events that it purports. Uh, and it follows this creedal format and Paul states that this is what he was told, this is what he received, and what he's passing on to others in, in writing. And this is what makes up the basis of his ministry. And for those who don't know, a little bit of background on, on Paul. He started off as uh, known as Saul and was a, uh, was a Pharisee. So he was a, a, a Jewish, um, I won't say zealot, but in this context that has a particular name or a particular meaning. Right. <laughs> so he was, he was a, a, a Jewish Pharisee, a religious leader, um, so to speak, who, who was actually persecuting the church. So he was persecuting early Christians. He had uh, them stoned, um, uh, as in they were murdered by being hit with rocks uh, and imprisoned for their, for their beliefs. Um, Stephen uh, was martyred as the first martyr. That was a, um, an event that Paul was at um, or saw at the time. And then he had a conversion to Christianity later. So um, he and comes back and he says... That's the road to Damascus that some people might know that expression but not know where, where it comes from. Exactly. And so, yeah, he's on the road to Damascus and he sees uh, Jesus appear to him uh, and speak to him and he winds up being converted and uh, uh, to Christianity and, be, and writing half of the New Testament, essentially, in his, in his letters and, and writings and correspondence with other churches. So he's writing in this um, letter to the Corinthians 
um, of what he had received, and this being the earliest Christian creed. For I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, being Peter, um, one of the, pri- the most prominent apostles, uh, then, to tw- then to the twelve. So throughout this, you know, this is... Um, early on and then again like i said matthew mark luke and john where we get the primary biographies of jesus those are four um uh, books that were written uh to capture the the life and the actions of jesus um they all show that they claim that this that this has occurred so we have multiple independent attestation multiple sources multiple authors all pointing at the fact that uh, the tomb was empty um and that jesus was raised can I ask you to clarify, because some people might think what you're saying is, oh, so these guys, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were all, like, hanging out with Jesus and saw him and die and then wrote firsthand accounts. So, so that's not what it, what it was. Right, yeah. So um, Matthew, um, well, let's start with Mark. Mar- Mark was uh, wound up later traveling with Paul and was converted after, or, sorry, with Peter. Um, although I think he did have uh, interaction with Paul as well. Um, and it's believed that he took on, uh, wrote down a lot of Peter's um, memories, accounts, and so forth, and took mm-hmm. took notes of that. Um, so he he primarily used uh, Peter as a source. Luke ha- is entirely independent. Um, he was a physician. He came back later uh, after his conversion, and he says that he tried to set out an orderly account of all the things that occurred. And then later he was actually traveling with Paul, which, is, which comes up in the book of Acts, because he wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Um, John... Um, there's some debate about uh, which John was actually there, because um, there are uh, a few Johns that are mentioned in, in the Bible, um, but it's commonly believed that uh, the traditional authorship shows that John was a disciple, um, as was as was Matthew, and so they were actually there um, and writing about what they had seen, what they had experienced. Okay, great. Um, okay, and so I, I don't know if you... Uh, what about the... Uh, is, is this a good time to talk about the the fact that women being the ones to first see him is or well no we're, we're doing the empty tomb still yeah well, well that's 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 entirely or relevant to the empty right tomb there. as okay, well okay yeah go so go, go ahead yeah so um the point that you're alluding to is that you know women found the empty tomb uh, so this uh, occurs in matthew mark luke and john um in all of these um and they were the first ones to find the empty tomb and then go report it now to the modern reader, what's the big deal, right? We read this, okay, women found it, and then they report it. But what's important to note is that um, this is a highly embarrassing detail, you know, coming back to the example of where I wet my pants because, uh, mm. I, and, and you pointed it out and I got angry about it. Um, this is embarrassing because the um, testimony of women in uh, at the time wasn't considered to be valid. It was they were considered to be hysterical. You couldn't rely upon them, so it wasn't even uh, permissible in court. Uh, and so, if you were going to be making up a story or inventing a story, the last group that you would put into this position to actually tell the good news, to spread the gospel, to say that he is risen, would be the women. Um, nobody would believe it. No, it'd be like, oh, come on, women. Um, you know, it, it's 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 a, it's a terribly unreliable, you know, uh, uh, witness. Uh, at least it was it was perceived to be at the time. Uh, think, you know, if uh, if I'm telling you, relating some news story to you, you're like, oh, where did you hear that? Oh, Alex Jones. You know, for uh, right. for <laughs> for a lot of people, they'd they'd immediately discount you. Um, they're like, oh, you heard it from him? Yeah, uh, forget about it. It's the same kind of situation here. Oh, you heard it from the women. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to buy that. I'll have to go see it with my own eyes. So this is an embarrassing detail. Again, showing that um, there's some uh, additional plausibility and veracity to the fact that the tomb was actually empty. And this is yeah, just to make sure everyone's ended. getting that again, because we're getting in the weeds. So again, to the silly analogy I made up there before that if what we're arguing about is, you know, did Christian punch me and was it justified or not? And then he admits, yes, I did punch him. But it wasn't because I'm a jerk or the aggressor. It's because he, uh, you know, saw that I wet my pants and was it was making fun of me. There, if suppose other people they're wondering. I wonder if Christian, you know, Bob probably didn't do that. I wonder if Christian really did just you know punch him for no good reason. Where 
if that's what your theory was, it would be hard for you to explain why would he bring in the wetness pants. Like, that doesn't, you know what I mean? He would have made up something else. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, Bob was was making fun of me because I was so jacked and he felt, you know, inadequate next to my manhood or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so likewise here, what they're saying is if you really think, guys, come on, clearly this is just a myth that arose around this guy Jesus. His followers started telling stories to make it a better story. They said, yeah, we saw him after he came back from the dead. Of course that's what happened. The guy didn't literally come back. What's wrong with you? And so Christian's pointing out, well, if that's what you think, it's weird that unanimously the accounts at the time had the feature that, oh, the first people to see him were women. Like, if you were just making it up after the fact to be making legendary or whatever, and you're just trying to tell people, oh, there was this guy, and he did all these wonderful things, he walked the water, and he came back from the dead, you wouldn't add in there, oh, and women were the ones who saw him. Like, it would just be, then you, you wouldn't, that would be a, a, a hitch up, a road bump in the story. And so the only reason they would have said that is if that's what they thought happened. Maybe they were nuts. Right, we're still gonna, you know, mm-hmm. we'll get to that in a minute. Like maybe they're just all we're nuts or, or whatever. But it's not that they were consciously making up a story because why would they put that detail in? That would defeat the whole purpose of them making up the story. Right. Yeah. Nobody's gonna believe it. They'll be incredulous. Uh, like I said, with Alex Jones, if if, if that's your source mm-hmm. for stuff, uh, most people are gonna discount you right away. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the other thing that we can point to, so we've got multiple independent attestation, we have women at the tomb, and the earliest uh, Jewish polemic against the resurrection is recorded in Matthew, um, and they say that uh, they, didn't, they didn't actually deny the empty tomb, they said that the body was stolen. So they essentially admit to the fact that the tomb is empty, but ba- that the apostles came and stole the body. So um, there's the enemy attestation aspect with this as well. So um, I can just read this from Matthew 28 here. Uh, While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell the people his disciples came by a night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. So, this is significant, again, because we have uh, the enemies of Jesus, the, the Jewish authorities who, who were the ones, again, think back to the story, they brought him forth uh, to Pilate. They found him guilty of, of, of blasphemy because he was claiming to be God. Um, and they brought him uh, in front of the Roman authorities to actually be executed because under Roman rule, they couldn't um, execute him themselves. And so they want to stamp out Jesus. They want to stamp out his movement that he had started. And now they're saying, okay, well, we need to come up with some kind of story to cover here. Say that the disciples, they're telling the Roman guards who were there, you fell asleep and the disciples came and stole his body away at the night. So they're admitting the fact of the empty tomb. Okay, let me stop you there. So, and that's the enemy attestation again, like you say, that it's, it's, they're quibbling about just like you saying, yeah, I did punch Bob, but it was because, uh, you know, he provoked me or something. So, so if, if they're saying, oh, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, the reason his tomb is empty is because his followers stole the body, they're admitting the tomb's empty. And a thing that William Lane Craig emphasized that I liked was in this context, in this milieu, if there really was a tomb that had a rock that didn't get rolled back and presumably Jesus' body was still in there, it would have been pretty easy just to go down there and say, wait a minute, no, there's still a corpse in there, you know, stop saying, you know, that, that would have quashed the, the claims Whereas if there wasn't a body, then they would be forced to fall back on, well, yeah, maybe somebody stole it because we know people don't come back from the dead. Yep. Um, but maybe now's the point for me to bring up, I know we talked about this before the show, that um, a curveball I had never thought of until I heard him say it was Bert Arman um, talking on the Cosmic Skeptic guy, I forget what his real name is, said something like, uh, well, they're just assuming that, th- that he was buried. That no, the Roman custom at the time was you let the body stay up on the crosses and let the scavengers get them just as further humiliation. So that's why there was no body because the scavengers took them. So this whole idea of the empty tomb is just ahistorical. The only evidence we have for Jesus being buried in a tomb is from the gospel accounts themselves. Right, yeah. And I, I find that uh, Ehrman tends to uh, ratchet up his uh, skepticism about a lot of this stuff mm-hmm. when he's giving interviews and discussions versus his published work and when you actually read that. Um, 
the the he he's making this claim uh, without in the face of evidence. You know, we have all this textual evidence that points to the fact that he was buried. The other thing that uh, we can point to is that, uh, um, according to the story, um, there was a, a prominent Jewish uh, leader, a member of the Sanhedrin. His name was uh, Joseph of Arimathea. He's said to have actually buried Jesus. So his disciples, again, we come back to some of these embarrassing facts, uh, fled. They were terrified. Um, they write in the Gospels that they ran, that they weren't there. Um, and so they left a, uh, a, a Jewish leader to actually take him, prepare the proper burial rites, and bury him in a family tomb. Um, so again, we've got more embarrassing details to, to level on top of this. Um, but even Ehrman admits that, you know, there isn't really, we don't really know what happened. There isn't a whole lot of textual evidence about Roman cruci crucifixion and, and, and what occurs in, in this in this situation. So I think he's just kind of trying to pull something out of his hat and say, well, you, just to be able to try to cast doubt where where he can on, on the burial story and the, and the idea behind it. Um, but again, it, it's, it flies in the face of all the evidence that we do have. Okay. Also, folks, I, it, so this is BobMurphyShow.com slash 295. I'll link, um, Christian, there was, I didn't tell you this, I had, I came across William Lane Craig on a pro, you know, William Lane Craig <laughs> podcast, where the guy was giving him an, an, an opportunity to respond to the Airman clip that I sent you, and they were going through point by point on this one, he did, ha besides just saying, you know, sort of a repetition of what we do have, and that he, he had some other, you know, his, historians talking about how in the case of like during the Jewish holiday festivals and whatnot that, you know, out of deference to the Jewish traditions, they, they would let the bodies be buried because that would have been offensive, you know, to leave the body up on the cross and whatever. So anyway, there, there's, there, I'll, so again, folks, I'll link to that. You can evaluate that separately, but William Lake Craig did pull in some external evidence to try to show that, no, that we do know that occasionally they did make exceptions. So it didn't say there was an exception made mm -hmm. for this Jesus of Nazareth guy. But to say it's Aaron to be just flatly saying no, they never let them take him down and bury him. That that's, we can kind of show that that's not true. Yeah, and one thing that you look at uh, if you read Josephus and and some of the other ancient historians is that there were a lot of exceptions made for Jews because they would uh, they had a tendency to uh, rise up in rebellion, in armed rebellion, if uh, mm -hmm. if the Romans got um, started trampling on the temple or or violating some of their religious beliefs and customs. Um, so you see that um, many times that exceptions are made uh, for this particularly troublesome province um, on the far ends of the of the Eastern Roman Empire. Okay, great. So I think. You know, you've made the case for, for the empty, with the, your three pronged thing about what historians want to look for. So the empty tomb, I think, we could say, all right, fair enough. And then yeah, we'll, we'll move on. Okay. There, there's one more point that I think okay. you, you touched on just a little bit about the fact that it's in Jerusalem, um, and and this is important context, I think, for the for the entire story. Uh, have you been to Jerusalem? It's a, it's no. a, it's, it's rather small actually. Mm -hmm. When you go to the old city, and when you visit the old city, you have walls that were, um, that were built up. Um, so it's a, it, the old city now is a walled city, but those walls are actually, I think, from the Ottoman times. Um, so the city of Jesus's time is actually much, much smaller. It's a very small place. This, if it wasn't for the religious significance of the city. Nobody would probably even bother with it today. You know, it's just it, it would have been tiny. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, there, there's nothing really to, to draw people there apart from you know the the, the ancient uh, religious significance and so forth uh, for it. But. Um, back in Jesus' time, it was it was a tiny place, and people estimate that there were you know a few ten thousands of people. I, I saw some estimate up to about a hundred, but I think the the consensus tends to be about you know twenty to thirty thousand people living there. So it's it's a small place, you know. Think ancient Near East, um, not uh, an expansive uh, city like I'm in Houston today. I mean, who knows what happens <laughs> from you know down the block because it's just it's just massively spread out, but. Um, People knew what, what was going on, and it's easy to check these claims. So if the tomb wasn't empty, uh, the fact that the church started in Jerusalem, uh, it would have been the easiest thing to disprove. Just go walk down to the, walk down to the tomb. Mm -hmm. It's just outside the walls. It's just right over there. You can go open it and take a look, and then it would be done and over with. Uh, Christianity wouldn't have gotten off the ground. You know, going back to the earlier point that we made, that Christianity just isn't, it, it's nothing without the resurrection. Um, we don't have any faith. We don't have any hope um, without the resurrection of Jesus. 
And so um, the fact that it started and um, in Jerusalem when it would have been the easiest thing in the world to check, I think is very, very significant. Uh, and we have good reason to believe that uh, the tomb is um, uh, on the site in the site of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre today. Um, so there's a l- ancient tradition that goes back to Eusebius. Um, when he had visited around uh, early 300s, um, so early 4th century, after Constantine had made Christianity the, the empire, he was there with, uh, with Constantine's mother. And she had asked about where the tomb of Christ was. And the um, uh, inhabitants, the Christians uh, there, had pointed to a temple of Apollo and said, oh, underneath this temple is actually where the the tomb is. So she had it raised and excavated, and underneath they found a simple tomb that was cut away um, and and fit the description. So we're talking within just a few hundred years that it had been within the memory of the church, the local church Mm -hmm. there within Jerusalem, that this is where Jesus was actually buried. Um, And so now there's a church that's built on top of it, you know, that the Crusaders built, and and they have the side of the cross, which is a little bit more... Maybe, maybe not, um, but it, it, it's clo- it's within the same complex. Um, but we have good reason to believe that that's actually the the, the site of the uh, of Jesus's tomb. Okay, great. I, I'm going to anticipate a little bit, but partly what we're getting at here is it would be weird if the budding church that grew up, you know, from these original people that were his disciples and they were preaching to people, they converted some other people, dismissed it, and as the church grew, you had this period where. A basic fact about the claims being made was you could go check and so it would be hard you would think it'd be hard for this movement to get off the ground if it was based on the premise that this guy was killed and then rose from the dead and a bunch of us saw him or we talked to people who did say they saw him if everyone's walking by and the tomb still had the big rock in front of it or you know you, you could they some they rolled it back and saw that there's still a guy wrapped up in in the uh, linens and such so that's kind of where what we're getting at here is that this this would have been a glaring problem for the early church that people could have whereas now we can't go check you know it's just all like oh well maybe maybe zeus did fire some thunderbolts down or who knows but again this is historical this was supposed to have really happened in recorded history and so um these people walking around there would have been able to check yeah, and, and the Christian Church at the time had no power. You know, it's not like uh, this was some um, powerful entity, uh, right. like it, like it became under Constantine and through the through the Middle Ages. There were a few dozen, you know, followers um, that that were really uh, key core followers, uh, and they just had their leader killed. Right, so mm-hmm. um, they were they had no political power, they had no um, military power, or any, anything like that, financial power, and so forth, in order to actually prevent any of this stuff from happening. If it was the case that we have this awkward fact of this tomb that we just say, "Hey guys, you can't go in," forget it. You know, it's going to be opened, especially if they're causing trouble. The Romans want to keep the peace, and they, the Jews bring more people up. You know, they're so it, it's just it, it's one of those things where uh, it's it's a it would be a really awkward situation, and I don't see how it would get off the ground in, in that small community. Uh, yeah. Also, because there'd be no gain, like you'd be subject to persecution and ridicule, right? Yep. Early, early on at that point. So again, it'd be hard. You could imagine people like all kind of going along with something that deep down knew didn't make sense, if it benefited them. So you know, some guy comes up with a, you know, some Ponzi scheme or whatever, and he's, you know, you can kind of. But to say, hey, come believe this thing that might get you killed. And by the way, you can see this has to be false because the tomb is sitting right there, you know, with the rock in front of it. That would be weird. Whereas, anyway, okay, we belabor that point. <laughs> yeah. So the the next point is is along the lines of the the post mortem appearances, and so this is pretty unanimous amongst scholars. Um, and I think a lot of people think that New Testament scholars are, by and large, Christians. Uh, it's really rather split between agnostics and, and, and Christians. So um, when we talk about New Testament scholars, there are a lot of critical scholars who are atheists. Or um, there's there's a weird case. I think John Dominic Crossan calls himself a, uh, a Christian, but he doesn't believe in God. I don't know how that works, how you fit that together, but you know, people aren't coming at this well, necessarily. Well, let me tell you, their... Christian. When I, that's funny, you're you're Christian. Um, when <laughs> I, I told you, I, I had a period where I called myself a devout atheist, and then before I called myself a Christian, I called myself a Christian with a small C. That's what I how I described it, and what I meant by that was, I liked like the influence of Christianity and Western culture and like all the values and stuff of it. 
I just didn't happen to believe that those mythological stories about this guy Jesus. That's what I meant by that. Okay. So. Yeah. So maybe it's a, it's along yeah. those lines, but yeah, yeah, it's it would still be an atheist, but wants to have the uh, trappings of Christian morality and, and influence. Yeah, or or maybe even further, like to admit, oh yeah, there was a historical guy Jesus who was an amazing teacher and mm-hmm. you know blah blah blah, more moral authority. I just don't, you know, I, I'm a scientist. I don't or scientific. I don't believe in miracles because come on, you know that kind of stuff. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So. Um, you know, the, the, regarding the postmortem appearances, though, most scholars, it, it's essentially unanimous that the scholars believe that mm-hmm. the disciples and followers of Jesus, that they saw something, that they had some experience of the risen Jesus afterwards. Now, what explains that, it, we'll get to in a little bit. But um, again, we can turn back to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, this passage that we, we keep going to, this early Christian creed. Um, later in it, um, you know, Paul talks, is writing, and he says that he appeared to Cephas or Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five. 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So we have appearances of Jesus um, being listed in in 1 Corinthians. Um, in Paul's writings, we have it in the Gospels as well. So again, we have multiple independent attestation. We have other Gospel writers who, who or other uh, New Testament writers who make reference to the appearances of Jesus after his death. Um, and one thing that's really interesting about this is that um, Paul's list is a challenge to, to readers, especially when he mentions the 500 brothers. It's a challenge mm-hmm. to inquire. He shows the intimate personal knowledge uh, and assumes it of his readers that, hey, if, if, if you doubt me, there are 500 people. You guys know who I'm talking about here. Uh, go ask them. Go check with them. Um, you can't just you know throw that out there again with these small communities of of believers like this um and without risking being contradicted and so you're not going to take those risks if you're trying to foist a lie on somebody yeah let me just reread that again make sure folks are getting that so again this is 1 corinthians 15 um and it's uh verse what is it six yeah yeah i'm saying then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So, again, what Christian's getting at here is why did Paul feel the need to put in that, you know, if he, said, he said, you know, he, he appeared to, um, to Cephas and then to the Twelve and then... Da, da, da. So why is he mentioning the fact that some are, most are still alive? And it seems to be, in the, in the context, what he means is go ask them like these people are still around you know because in other words paul is trying to convince them this stuff really happened i mean, you don't just take my word for it and he's listing other things so i, I get it's certainly what what this isn't is just say you got to have faith man just you know consult your heart and see if mm-hmm. the spirit moves you that's not what he's doing here he's saying you know he appeared to 500 people i, I don't know christian right now if we there is a distinction that um aaron made in that interview i saw where he was saying it's not we don't know that jesus appeared to 500 people we know you know we have testimony from paul we don't have testimony from those 500 but again it's it's a little better than that this isn't merely paul saying something it's significant that in a letter to a, the church in corinth that he's saying he appeared to 500 people many of whom are still around like mm-hmm. meaning you can go check with them so that's it would be, it would be risky for him to say that you know what I mean? Like it, it is boastful. He's sticking his neck out. Right. Yeah. And and if if you're sticking your neck out for a lie in these types of situations, making these types of claims, you know, you're 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 risking you know being exposed for it. And and Paul claims that he saw Jesus himself. You know, that's his whole conversion, which is really remarkable. I mean, we we talked about it a little bit earlier, but he was literally killing Christians and putting them in prison, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then had this conversion experience. So whatever might explain that. Um, there is no doubt amongst scholars that he had saw, he experienced something, you know. Um, some try to talk it away and say, oh, he had some guilt complex, which he gives no indication of in his writing. Um, but he did see something. He had some experience um, of, of Jesus after his death. So you made a, gr- a great point. I just want to make sure, and I kind of jumped in on you to explain what, what could it mean to say he's a Christian but an atheist. But the, the the more important thing you were saying there was when you when we refer to and I and I didn't know this until you know relatively recently, I had just assumed if you're going to go into and make your career 
being a New Testament scholar, surely you must be a Bible-believing Christian, otherwise, or maybe you could be Jewish. Otherwise, why would you waste your time studying some book you didn't believe in? Like that, I would have thought that. But yet, there are plenty of academics who are New Testament scholars who don't believe in the, you know, the 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 uh, metaphysical claims in these in these texts. Mm -hmm. And so when you yeah, say absolutely, so when you say they. It, it's the consensus among this group that there were lots of in separate people who believed they had seen Jesus after he was crucified. They're not necessarily saying because he's the Messiah and the you know <laughs> and, and the Lord. That's not what they're saying. They're just saying that no, the best interpretation of the evidence we have is these people really did believe they saw him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whether it was a. Uh... You know, what is it, Charles Dickens, who, who puts it in Scrooge uh, about having, oh, ate something bad and had a bad dream or something like that, or right. whether it's some guilt complex or so forth. You know, that's, that's you know, where a lot of the scholars will go to, um, but they don't dispute the fact that these appearances did occur. Right. Okay. So, so like, I, I, a quote that I like to share comes from uh, Gerd Lundemann, who um, has passed away recently, but he uh, he's a skeptical um German textual critic, and he, he writes that it may be t uh, taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. So again, he's someone who doesn't believe in God, he doesn't believe uh, that Jesus is, is the Son of God, but he says that, hey, this is, this is basically certain because we have all this evidence, we have everybody, every gospel writer, um, we have Paul, we have all the New Testament writers saying, hey, I saw this, I experienced it. We have Paul putting saying, you guys know, you know, appealing to his audience and saying, this is what occurred. We have um, uh, the sermons and acts saying, hey, and we saw it, you saw this too. And what's the best explanation for that? Okay, well, they saw something. All right, we can't deny this anymore. They saw something. They believe that they saw something. And then, okay, yeah, how do we explain You know, it? you, you cite in Paul, I, I don't know why I never thought of it like this before, but yeah, the last person in the world who should have converted and started evangelizing was Saul. Mm -hmm. That You know what I mean? Like, in terms of just, first of all, just kind of like, um, if you think eating meat is, is murder or something, like a guy who works... I don't know, for a beef company or something, it's going to be one, one of the last people to do that or something, you know what I mean? Or, or somebody in the slave trade all of a sudden, you know, becoming an abolitionist. Like, that, that, that's stacking the deck because they like just, you would think they would come up with all sorts of reasons to not believe that because otherwise they would feel so guilty. So, yeah, a guy who was actively persecuting Christians, you would think would be sure to not all of a sudden believe Jesus actually was was who they claimed because then uh oh you were just persecuting people who are serving god that's not good and yeah. it's not like oh he he did it because of all the fame and accolades and comfortable lifestyle that he ended up with because he switched sides that no mm -hmm. he was in prison a lot you know so okay yeah exactly and, and that kind of gets into some of the alternative explanations that people have about you know the conspiracy and so forth so we can hold that off to to, to a little bit later um but yeah, so we talked about the empty tomb, we talked about the appearances, and then the next one I just want to talk about is the rise of Christianity. And I think that's a good segue because we do have a radical change in the apostles after the appearances, including Saul becoming Paul. Um, mm -hmm. And so N.T. Wright, he has a wonderful book. Um, I'm not sure if you're, if you're familiar with him, but he's a, uh, um, an Anglican uh, New Testament uh, scholar and theologian. And um, he has this, I don't know if I have it seen over here. Oh, I do. Here, I can hold it up. Um, this lovely seven, eight hundred page tome <laughs> is basically making the entire case that um, it's as big as human action. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> um, making the entire case that uh, the there there was no a pagan or Jewish precedent for believing that uh, Jesus would be would be. Um, raised from the dead uh, within history. So within that context, uh, there are no pagan uh, parallels or similars or similarities um, to this resurrection of the dead in history or uh, Jewish uh, similarities. So the Jews believed that the resurrection would occur at the end of history. So for Jews to take on this belief that, hey, actually he, he was risen, um, 
today, and we can see it, we, we know about it, uh, was entirely outside of, their, outside of their worldview. It was something that they were entirely hostile to. Um, John uh, 11, uh, 23 through 24 actually shows this well. Um, I don't have the verse in front of me right now, but um, this is basically where uh, Jesus is talking to Mary about Lazarus. And so Lazarus is someone who he raised from the dead. He, he brought back mm-hmm. to life. And Jesus makes the, the uh, claim, um, and I'm paraphrasing because, like I said, I don't have the verse right here. But he says that uh, Jesus, or that uh, Lazarus, will live again. And Mary's response is, "Yes, we know that. At, and it, you know, at the end of history, th- this is going to occur later." Um, and Jesus uh, says something similar about himself um, that he will rise as well. Um, but you know, he bring he bring, brings Lazarus up. This shows you know just a little snapshot of some of the Jewish belief at the time. They didn't think that resurrection occurred within a, within history. It was something that happened at the end, um, whenever uh, as part of their eschatology. Um, and so, the fact that Jesus would die. They had no expectation of, of his resurrection. Um, they didn't remember that he was going to be raised on the third day, even though he had mentioned it with, throughout the Gospels, um, which is why you don't see them at the tomb. You see the women going to um, mourn and going to uh, going to see the tomb. Uh, the apostles were still in hiding. Nobody was expecting this uh, to actually to actually occur. Um, so this and, is good. Can I stop you for a second? Because yep. I'm just trying to remember my, because I was surprised when I first heard what you're going over. Because, you know, in the gospel accounts, there's a famous, the Sadducees approach Jesus and they're trying to trap him. And it says the Sadducees who do not believe in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And they go through the story about the woman who goes through seven husbands and then say in the resurrection, who's who's going to be her husband? Like thinking, duh, this can't be right. Like there is no resurrection. That's how we we avoid this paradox. And then he corrects them. But... um, I had assumed from that 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 meant, oh, so not besides the Sadducees, the other standard Orthodox Jews did believe in the resurrection. And so, it, it, you know, it wouldn't have been surprising that Jesus came back from the dead if he was who he claimed to be. But you're saying that, no, they even though they were waiting for the Messiah, they didn't think the Messiah was going to be killed and come back from the dead like in normal times, like at the end of the world, it would happen. Like the, everybody would come up and re- be resurrected, but it's not that you expected the mess- the Messiah was just supposed to be a, a, a political military person to liberate them. He a wasn't conqueror. supposed to get killed and come back from the dead soon thereafter. That, that wasn't, they didn't think they were waiting for somebody to do that. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that Jewish context I think is really important. Um, and I, th- it was something that when I was younger, I, I was, totally oblivious to, you know, growing up in a Christian household and, and right. culture, you know, the, the Jewish background of Jesus and the apostles, that Jesus was a Jew. His uh, earliest followers, disciples, they were Jews. You know, they had, they, you know, were following this ancient Jewish practice and, and religion and had all those beliefs and, and everything, um, biases and so forth. And so they, they expected Jesus to come, or the, the, they, they were looking for the Messiah. And so when Jesus says he's the Messiah, they're like, this is great. This is awesome. You're going to get rid of Rome. Um, and this is their bias. They don't expect him to be killed. They don't expect him to, to be resurrected. Um, it, they expect him to throw off the oppression. Is that why, because now I think maybe it makes more sense, because it's when you know Jesus tells them, you know, who do you, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you know, who, who you are. And he said, yes, it's been given to you. And then he's now I'm going to go up and get killed and peter says oh no you won't <laughs> we won't yeah. let that happen yet he says get get away from me He's, you know satan so is that partly to understand why peter was so sure that no clearly we're not going to let that happen because it would just been inconceivable to peter that part of god's plan was that the messiah is going to get killed right like that yeah. doesn't make any sense so yeah it was entirely outside of jewish expectations and there were many messianic movements that had occurred in ancient judaism um and what typically happened was afterwards, you know, they, they, they would be scattered if, if the leader was killed, died, whatever, or just over time, you know, people tend to grow old and die and, uh, or, you know, they get bored with waiting around for you to, 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 to rise up and, and claim your throne as the Messiah. Um, so they get scattered. You, you see this in Acts when, um, I think it's, uh, Galam, uh, uh, I'm going to butcher his name, so I'm not going to say it. Um, but it was uh, Paul's uh, teacher, and uh, he was saying that, hey, this has happened before. Um, the Christians say that uh, th- this was the Messiah. Either it's of God or if it's not. If it's not of God, then just let it be. It'll die out like all the others. If it is of God, then don't oppose it because now you're opposing God. 
Um, and N.T. Wright puts it uh, similarly where he says that, uh, you know, what do you get when your favorite messiah gets himself killed? You've basically got two options, you know, go back into obscurity or get yourself a new messiah. Um, and so the, uh, the apostles, by all evidence, went back into obscurity. At least that's what they attempted to do until the uh, uh, post-mortem appearances, which radically changed their approach and their understanding of who Jesus was. Okay. Uh, and, and that being, you know, we would say because they went from utter despair and, you know, oh, geez, we really thought it was him. I guess not. What mm-hmm. a bummer. Like, he was so wise and he did all those miracles, but no, they killed him. Jeez. To, no, he came back and now you're all. And, and also, we better keep our head down because they're going to kill us if they know, if they find that we were following that guy they just took out. But then to go from that to just boldly proclaiming Jesus what would what would explain that shift and obviously you know if he did appear to them or from a skeptic's point of view if they thought he appeared to them then that that would at least explain the transformation right and and in this transformation is radical uh and it's hard to to, to overstate that uh, they had ran, they had scattered. Peter, you know, was who is um, shown in the in the in Gospels as repeatedly putting his foot in his mouth. Um, mm-hmm. and, you know, he runs. Uh, he says that hey, he won't deny Jesus, um, and he'll be with him till the very end. Then he denies him on three separate occasions uh, during his trial and and subsequent crucifixion. And so he runs and goes into hiding. And then afterwards, he becomes the one who's out boldly is preaching. You know, he he was too scared to be associated with him and then now uh, just a few chapters later when you get to Acts after the after the resurrection he's now saying um, preaching to to the masses in Jerusalem um, and he you know it, it's funny I've, I've got it here on from Acts 2 uh, 29 he says brothers I may say to you with confidence um, and you know he's, he's up there and, and preaching and he also references the tomb about the patriarch David that he died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day this Jesus God raised up and of all of that we are all witnesses you know he's appealing to common knowledge here and saying that, hey, this is something that we've seen happen. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this to you that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, the Jesus whom you crucified. So he goes from cowering in a corner and wanting nothing to do with Jesus to uh, shortly thereafter proclaiming to the same people who had just crucified Jesus that hey you guys uh you guys don't get it this is this is the Christ this is Jesus you crucified him he was raised up God raised him up we all saw this we witnessed this appeals to the common knowledge and the church begins to spread first taking root in Jerusalem great yeah and again it's I I have to mention I just love you know Peter denies Jesus three times just as Jesus predicted he would but then when they when he comes back where they're like on the seashore or something and, and he's saying, do you love me? He says, yes, of course I do, Lord, and feed my sheep. And he, and he says three times, do you love me? Mm-hmm. Like, so just, I think to let Peter proclaim his, you know, obedience to him three times to kind of make up, well, you get what I'm saying. Like, yeah. Jesus, I think, like doing that just because he's such a cool leader and knows that, no, this guy's got to forgive himself. Like, I forgive him, but I got to get him to, to, to believe he can move on with his life because obviously he's going to feel horrible about what he did. So anyway, just I love that part. Okay, yeah. so we've done that, and now do you want to go and so, – so again, I, I just want to make sure people get – because I remember when I read H.L. Mencken's Treatise on the Gods – and he was going through and blowing up Christian, you know, making fun of things and whatever. And then he thought Jesus really did come back from the dead. That was his, ex- he didn't think he was God, but that, that was how he came up. So it's interesting. Like, I think, uh, you know, outsiders say, I don't even know if Jesus existed. This is all hocus pocus. Like folks, if you get into the material, like Christian here is saying, quoting some of these people who are skeptics that know the, we, it does seem like the best explanation is that these people thought they saw him. And so now, so how can we now explain that, you know, there's different ways to try to explain besides the fact that, oh yeah, it's because Jesus was the son of God and came back, you know, and he, and he was, he was who he said he was. He was there at the creation of the universe. Suppose you don't want to say that. What, what else might, what has been offered as explanations for how could, could these facts that you've, let, let's take these three sets of facts that you've said and then how, how else could somebody explain this stuff? 
Yeah, so what you find when you get to the literature is that there are basically four naturalistic explanations that people come to, and they've gone in and out of popularity over the years. This is Christianity's old. This has been debated for thousands of years, <laughs> and people coming up with um, with different hypotheses. And what's interesting is, you know, 2,000 years of history, we've got basically five hypotheses. The resurrection, uh, which I hold to and, and Bob holds to, but um, then four others, uh, one being the swoon theory, a misplaced tomb, group hallucinations, and the uh, favorite apostolic conspiracy. Um, these are these are basically you know what people uh, point to and say, hey, this is what um, explains it. This, this explains the evidence. Now, when we're evaluating these different hypotheses, you have to consider the different lines that, that we laid out. So I, I gave three things that, three, three facts that we need to account for. The empty tomb, post-mortem appearances, and the change in the apostles. And, uh, you know, we've already gone for, I don't know, an hour and 10 minutes. And I, I said at the outset, we could add maybe three or four lines of evidence to this that would also need to be explained. So you need to have some sort of um, explanation that accounts for all of the all of the evidence. So when we look at these, the swoon theory, basically, uh, this is the theory that Jesus was on the cross and he didn't actually die, but he was brought and interred in the tomb and then recovered in the tomb and was able to roll away the, the rock and then go and appear to his disciples. And they believed that he was now resurrected. So this theory has a number of different issues with it, uh, challenges. Uh, first, we know from that the Romans were very good at killing people, <laughs> and especially uh, with crucifixion. Uh, this is basically where you, you know, you're put up on the cross, you're let to bleed and actually asphyxiate um, because you can no longer, you lose so much strength, you lose so much blood, you can't push yourself up to be able to expand your lungs and breathe, and so you actually die of, of asphyxiation asphyxiation and I can't speak today and um, so uh, they pierced his side as the gospels say to be able to ensure that uh, the blood had emulsified so if it's not um, uh, if it's not uh, continuously circulating it'll it'll emulsify and it says that uh, you know blood and water came out okay we can say that maybe the gospel writers made that up even though they didn't really know that that was uh, uh, necessarily what was happening um, they put him in the tomb and then you know you ha you you're now said that you have to believe that he was in terrible need of medical uh, attention um, after being tortured put on a on a cross for for hours in the hot sun and left uh, left there to die that he was able to roll away a tomb get past the guards and then go to his uh, apostles and then they suddenly believe hey um, He's risen. Uh, so this can account for the empty tomb, right? If he's not there, if he, if he was able to get escape, it, it can account for that. Um, and it can account for the post-mortem appearances because now we, we say that people people see him. But I think it stretches credulity <laughs> um, to say that, uh, you know, this is going to change everybody's life and to be like, oh, hey, you, uh, you made it out alive. So now we believe that you're the resurrected Messiah. Uh, and and this is going to change change everything and change the entire world. Um, I just I, I think that it very weakly accounts for for the evidence and it, it's very contradictory to what we know about crucifixion and modern medicine to to say that he he, he survived it and recovered in the tomb. Okay, yeah. So I guess my reaction, what you're saying, I would put the emphasis a little different. I mean, you hit all the main points that I would have, but I would I would say more there's no way he's getting up to the point where he is surviving and walking around mm -hmm. that I, if he did manage to get to that point, then I could understand. I mean, that's kind of what Mencken's theory was that they thought he was dead and then he came out and was talking to him and then they believed and, you know, and so that transformed them and they, and so that's what gave them the, you know, the inspiration, the courage to go preach in his name is no, we saw what they did to him. And then we were talking to him two days later or, you know, I'm getting, so, yeah. I, but again, I think you and I are just quibbling on different where to put the emphasis. I would just say I get that there's, like you said, it, even if he did technically, if he if he still had some brain activity, and the Romans you know didn't have him hooked up to a EKG and, and whatever, still he would have been in serious trouble wrapping him up, putting him behind a, a, a thing. It's not that oh yeah, you just if you go through something like that, just go take a good nap and then you're pretty much okay. Right, like that's not that's not normally how that would how you would think that would would work, yeah. and it would have been. They would have wanted to make sure he was dead, like mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying. Like that's they would they with a case like that they wouldn't want to botch that and then have him going around, you know. So, 
Yeah, and, and it contradicts a lot of the worldview and predisposition of the ancient Jewish culture that we just talked about and their belief. You know, now that he's not killed by this, uh, now suddenly they change their entire theology and say, oh, resurrections can happen. Um, and again, what we mean by resurrection is not somebody just coming back to life. That's a recitation. Uh, but the uh, gospel writers are very clear that resurrection, you get a resurrected body. You get something different. He's I mean, Jesus is shown as uh, appearing to people, um, coming through locked doors. And, and, and being able to appear. So there's something very, very different in the descriptions that they have of Jesus after the resurrection than you would imagine with, uh, with a swoon theory. Oh, okay, yeah. So sorry, maybe I wasn't being completely fair to what your point was. You were say, saying to really explain the life-changing, it was that, yeah, they were in a locked room and he shows up and he looks different. It's not just that, oh, yeah, he's the same guy with some holes in his hands and stuff. Like, yeah. He, he seems like somebody who was dead and came back from the dead. Mm -hmm. And so and that's what would make them really, you know, okay. Yeah, it, 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 it's radically different than just being seeing somebody in terrible need of medical attention. <laughs> right, right, right. That you get there. So the next theory uh, is the misplaced tomb theory, uh, which is essentially... It goes that they buried him, and then either they weren't sure where the tomb was, or it maybe um, in the intervening days the Romans had moved him to a different tomb. He was at a temporary tomb that they saw. Mm -hmm. You know, however it might have happened, uh, the apostles and the followers thought he was in tomb A, and he actually was in tomb B. You know, uh, other door, and so um, this theory does account for the uh, for the tomb. Um, it doesn't account for the post-mortem appearances. You have to try to link this with something else, and you know, which is kind of building on, you know, I think the the credulity to say, okay, now we got to try to you know supplement it with some other stuff, a little ad hoc. Um, but it doesn't uh, explain the post-mortem appearances or or the change. Uh, you know, the proponents ask you to say, okay, go and check out the tomb, and he's not there, and then you run around and say, oh, he was risen. Again, this goes very much against the Jewish presuppositions and their theological beliefs that they had at the time, um, that suddenly he's risen. Where do they get the boldness um, and, and so forth? Where do they get the appearances? How does this uh, this occur um, without without the resurrection if they just thought it was in a different tomb? And then again, what, if he's in a different tomb, then why don't the Jewish or the Roman authorities, whoever's interested in actually putting this down, and there were many people interested in it, why don't they just go say, hey, guys, check over here. Christianity is dead once they produce a body. Right, right. So the next one, and, and, and let me just emphasize again. That's why you're putting so much weight on this idea. Like to say, this was not the standard framework for you know the Jews of that day. So mm -hmm. it, it wasn't that they were waiting and saying, we know, you know, from the prophets of old, that the Messiah is going to come. The authorities are going to put him down, but then he's going to come back from the dead, and then watch out, everybody. They, they weren't waiting for that. And so it just be, yeah, if there were a misplaced tomb or something, you know, they, oh, we thought he was buried here, but now he's not there. That would not have been enough, presumably, to generate, like, oh, let's just say we saw him, and then we'll tell everyone he's the, the resurrected Messiah that we've all been waiting for. Like, no, you would be totally changing the, your religious views. So that's just, it's weird. Whereas if, if he really did come back to them and so on, then you could see that. Say, yeah, okay, I guess our re religious framework needs to be updated because we're sitting here talking to this resurrected Christ. But yeah, there's some okay. evidence we need to account for now. <laughs> okay, next yeah. one. So then the next one that's often, and I think probably the most popular one, is about hallucinations. So this is the belief that um, after he was uh, uh, executed, that the apostles were in such grief and despair that they hallucinated and imagined that they uh, saw the risen Jesus. And then they went out and uh, proclaimed him risen to the people. Um, I alluded to it earlier, but sometimes they say that uh, Saul was so guilty. And so then therefore he... Um, so it had some sort of appearance or some sort of vision that changed his life because of that was brought about by his guilt. It's not that Jesus actually rose. It was something psychological with him. Um, now, this is, I, I think Paul's a real big fly in the ointment with that because he gives no indication in any of his writing. Uh, he actually says the, the exact opposite, that he was, you know, progressing basically in his career up through the ranks, and he was, you know, doing all this stuff because he was zealous uh, for uh, for his religion, the religion of his forefathers, and so forth. Uh, he doesn't give any sort of indication of having remorse or um, 
uh, pity or, or being upset or, or any kind of distress about what he had d done even after his um, after his conversion. And so it's like, okay, so where are you getting? Are you trying to you're trying to psychoanalyze this guy from a, a distance of a couple thousand years <laughs> and say, okay, yeah, this is this is what occurred with you. Um, not to mention, you talk about uh, the evidence of the 500 people that he that uh, Jesus appeared to at once. Um, you have to kind of just write that away and say, ah, that didn't happen. Paul's just making that up. But then why did why does he say this in his in his writing? Why do we also have Luke writing about how he appeared to multiple people simultaneously? We have all the gospel writers saying that he appeared to multiple people simultaneously. When people hallucinate, they don't share hallucinations. That's a private subjective experience. You know, it's not something that, uh, you know, you're going to get around with friends and be like, all right, let's all hallucinate about the same thing together. You know, um, it's, it's just, there's no there's no record of this occurring or, or anything along those lines. So uh, I think, it, it, again, it, it's hard to take the hallucination view seriously, and especially you come back to the empty tomb. Okay, how do you explain the empty tomb? Where does this come from? Because um, Again, you, just, you just stop Christianity in its tracks by pointing back to the empty tomb or a uh, filled tomb. I guess I, let me push back a little bit on the, the Paul. I mean, he does say in the letter to Timothy, like he's the worst of sinners or something mm -hmm. like that. So I guess at least at that point, now, that makes sense that given now his new perspective, yikes, what I was doing was really. But, but so anyway, I, I guess, you know, somebody who wants to argue that maybe he did have some kind of, you know, thing mounting up in him. I guess you know that that would be something you would you could point to if you wanted to make a psychological case. Yeah, and I think you know Paul's making more of a theological point with that. I, you know, I, more than I, anything. Sure, sure. I'm just saying, if somebody wanted to push back, then maybe they would say that mm -hmm. on that one little narrow claim about is there any evidence that Paul may have you know felt really guilty about what he had done, and then needed to come up with some. Oh well, fortunately there was this guy who died for my sins and cleansed me. Phew. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so. What, what what would you say to somebody that was like, come on guys, there, there's multiple in, attestations and people uh, saying that aliens abducted them and did things, and when they described what the aliens look like, they're kind of similar accounts. So, are you telling me that that's all that must be true, or is it more the accounts? You know, they know what the previous people said they saw, and then their story kind of fits into it too, and you, you get. And maybe you're going to believe in aliens, too. I don't, I don't know where you stand on the alien question. <laughs> but I'm just saying you, you can understand a skeptic who doesn't believe that alien saucers have routinely been abducting people and probing them. Couldn't you say a lot of the stories are quite similar? And my theory is that people heard what others said and then, you know, said the, a similar thing. Something, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. Yeah. And could there, that have happened here. Yeah, I think that there, you, you could say, okay, hey, there, there's some similarities because people are saying that they, they saw this or they experienced this, and, and you'd have to look into it. Um, but as far as I know, I, I'm not a ufologist by any means or <laughs> read up on that, on that literature, but as far as I know, I don't think that there are any group you know, um, visitations or anything like that, 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 that you necessarily see apart from, you know, people saying, oh yeah, we saw lights in the sky, you know, which could have multiple other sure, um, sure. explanations and so forth. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm fairly agnostic on the alien question. I'm doubtful, but, uh, right. you know, agnostic. Yeah, I was trying to put you in a spot. <laughs> but I'm just saying the, the way I know people explain mm -hmm. the homogeneity of the testimony about, oh, I was abducted from a cornfield and blah, 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 you know, the stories. I actually haven't looked at it myself, but the claim is that they're all kind of similar. And so the theory is people just heard what the last guy said and then made a similar thing and da, da, da. So here, but you're saying it's not just that one person came forward and said, oh yeah, Jesus came back to me and he looked like this and he was glowing and he was white and the, and the next person's, oh, oh yeah, I saw him too. That there were at least some that said, no, he appeared to a bunch of us and like you say, Jerusalem was small. Those people would have interacted. It would have been weird for the early church to get going if like it required hundreds of them to all like, here's what we're going to tell people. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess again, leads leads into the next one, right? Yeah, and and you still have the empty tomb in front of you, and and, and, and you know, yeah, as you're kind of getting ahead to the the apostolic conspiracy, you, you know, the the conspiracy theory that they all gathered together, they came up with a story, they invented it, and then they went out and spread it. Um, this has a lot of issues as well. Um, you, basically, you have to say that they they stole the body. I should give it a better, you know, more steel man uh, approach. So let me back up a little bit. So the um, apostolic uh, conspiracy view is that the apostles got together 
and they decided, hey, we're going to take the body and proclaim him resurrected. So they go and they uh, are able to take the body out of the tomb. So now you have an empty tomb. Uh, and then they go and they uh, uh, dispose of the body somehow um, and proclaim that Jesus has been has been resurrected. And this gives, you know, um, they say that they saw him. And so it's basically that they, they make up the whole story. Um, so some issues with this, again, Paul remains, remains a big issue. <laughs> you know, how do you explain Paul uh, from going from a persecutor of the church to suddenly being uh, chief of this conspiracy? Um, the other thing, too, is that uh, you don't have people knowingly die for a lie. Um, there's a, a, a great book by Sean McDowell on the fate of the apostles. And he goes through each of the apostles, and he tries to track down as best as he can um, what happened to each of them. And in almost every case, they were you know, imprisoned, tortured, killed um, for their beliefs and for spreading uh, the gospel because they were doing it in the face of, of, of Roman persecution, Jewish persecution, pagan persecution outside of the uh, outside of the Roman Empire. Um, and this happens time and time again. They have no um, earthly gain. Uh, that that's discernible at all. Um, they they don't pick anything up out of it, so they have really no motivation to do this. So it's really hard to understand how these people who are by and large rather uneducated. You know, we're talking about fishermen. Um, mm-hmm. We have a tax collector who might have been in Matthew, who may have been somewhat educated, um, but not. Uh, these aren't sophisticated people yet. They're they're producing documents uh, that uh, have a lot of the hallmarks of historicity. Um, they have uh, a lot of information they're putting out there. They're they're making powerful arguments and preaching to people and starting what's now the world's largest religion based on what they know to be a lie, despite facing persecution and suffering, getting no material gain, and so forth. Um, yeah, and it's like you can't even say that. Uh, oh yeah, they were hoping that we'd talk about them later, you know? Because even some of the apostles, like how many people talk about um, Thomas, or apart from saying he was a doubting Thomas, you know, it's it's mm-hmm. it's not like they're they're doing this for posterity, is purpose, so, um, and so forth. Um, it's it, it, it's really uh, stretches things. There's actually a really good. Um, are are you familiar with the YouTube channel Lutheran Satire? No. Okay, I'll send you some links, but they have a, a good one about the um, apostles. It was made like 15 years ago, so with some bad CGI and so forth, but uh, it adds to the charm of, uh, <laughs> of sure, the discussion. Sure. I love that stuff. Okay. Because yeah, uh-huh. it, it shows kind of how ridiculous it is that they, they, they get together, they're going to be imprisoned, beaten, shipwrecked, tortured, killed eventually for what they know to be a lie. Right, and like you're saying, it's not from our vantage point looking back, we know it, quote, worked. So mm-hmm. you can. It, it seems more plausible to us that they would have done that, but at the time, they didn't know. If they thought if they thought they were making it up just to to try to pull one over on people, then yeah, they didn't know it was going to be successful and that they would be talked about two thousand years later. Um, and I want to clarify too on this that it's because I, I heard some. Pu- I've seen people push back and say. Well, Bob, a lot of people died for the Soviet Union, mm-hmm. you know, that they, they really believed in communism. So I guess communism's true, huh? And that's, that's misunderstanding the point. Like, the, the, well, they don't thing, necessarily they, know. They believed in communism, right. right? In other words, where it's not, whereas here it is what, what the claim is the Christians making, folks, is they would have, what they were telling people... Yeah, they could say, oh, I believed in Christ's message, like the Sermon on the Mount and all that stuff. But if they also said he came back from the dead when they knew he didn't, that would be weird that they would be willing to die for something that where they knew what they were saying was wrong. Whereas people willing to die for communism, I think they were mistaken, but they weren't actually dying for something that they knew was false. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a different type of thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could say, uh, let's imagine that, uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't have a good example off the top of my head, but... Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's hard to imagine that that they would knowingly, when they're often given the chance to recant and say, hey, just just give it up and, uh, you know, you go free. No, I'm not going to give this up. You go to your death proclaiming something that you know to be a lie that you invented and that you, uh, it's hard it's hard to imagine. Now, Christian, I've held you as long as I thought. I know you have some more points. Can you go another 15 minutes? Yeah, yeah, we can we can go on. Okay, yeah, why don't, so let's, yeah, why don't you let's try to keep it to 15 just to respect your time and also for the listeners because I think there's a trade-off if we go longer then fewer people are likely to start the episode kind of thing but I, I see you've still got some great objections you want to now handle 
Yeah, and, and we've covered some of those, but you know the the the, the fifth hypothesis that we'll put forward though is the resurrection hypothesis that we've been alluding mm-hmm. to you know because this does actually account for all the evidence it does account for the empty tomb it does account for the change in the apostles it accounts for the rise of the church it accounts for the fact that they it wasn't able to be stopped in its tracks uh, tracks early on you know strangled in the in the, in the cradle so to speak mm-hmm. um, that this and this movement actually changed changed the world um, based on the death and resurrection of, of, of one man I think that's the only plausible explanation and you know people can say okay yeah sure you'd say of course you'd say that because you're biased and you're coming at it and you know we all come at it with our biases um but it, the i think what's important is to try to sit down and and actually examine the evidence that's before us and try to come to the the best most well-informed conclusion that we can yeah i mean i think the most a critic could say is like i think we would all have to concede that the resurrection theory or hypothesis accounts for all the stuff you've brought it's just the objections to it some other people could say are overwhelming. Like, yeah, I agree in terms of we just looked at the considerations of the things you brought up in this episode of the Bob Murphy Show. The resurrection is a better explanation of those facts than any rival theory. But just like with some of those other theories when you were, like, knocking them down and you were coming, well, it couldn't be the swoon theory because and you appeal to something else. Like, when the Romans wanted to kill somebody, they really killed them. Mm-hmm. Well, likewise, I could say... Well, yeah, if he really did resurrect, then it would explain all that. But you know what? I know people don't resurrect. So there you go. Right. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? So it's... Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and that goes back to somebody's, you know, pre-existing biases that, that we have. Mm-hmm. You know, if you rule um, supernatural hypotheses out, um, you know, immediately and say that, hey, those are off the table, then sure, you're never going to come to that conclusion because you've ruled it out in, from the outset. Um, but if you do open yourself up to that, I think it's the most plausible and likely um, uh, piece of piece of evi- or ex- explanation for the evidence that we have, and you know we could give other evidences for the existence of God and so forth, and and why we think that that's permissible. And so I think you could make a strong cumulative case when you start to look across uh, different fields beyond just the resurrection um, to maybe get somebody to say, okay, I, I can accept supernatural explanations because I realize that naturalism, you know, or the view that everything's just material, matter, and motion, energy is. Um, is lacking. So now we want to try to buttress this, provide a supernatural explanation, accept that into our worldview, and then you can accept it and so forth. Okay, yeah. And even regardless of what you want to do, like I said, H.L. Mencken, if I'm not misremembering what he said, thought that... I don't know what his stance was. Was Jesus literally dead or was he just weakened and then recovered? I don't, I don't remember if he even took a stand on that. But yeah, he not as a Christian, but just as a guy, looking at the evidence, he thought it looks like he was killed and then later was walking around talking to people and they believed he came back from the dead. Like, that's the only way I can explain this stuff. So it, I think just establishing that, get in the context of other people having been taught and told authoritatively by skeptics online that we don't even know if this Jesus guy existed. Like, if that's where they're coming from, to hear you and me talking and you just say that consensus among New Testament scholars is a bunch of people believe they saw him. Like, I think that's really moving the ball down the field at the very least. Yeah, for sure. Do you want to get, we can get into some of the objections. I know we covered a couple of these, you know, in our, through the course of our discussion, but you just raised the one about Jesus yeah. never existing. And Yeah. If you don't mind, like, can I just ask you to, to do, I want that one. And then the, um, the mashup of ancient myths. <laughs> okay. Those are the ones I hear all the time. And at first they seem so like such a slam dunk. Mm hmm. So, so yeah, so for one thing, Jesus never existed. Like, come on, the only evidence we have of him is in the Jesus book. Well, you know, if he's this huge figure, how come we don't see all kinds of other evidence in non-religious, you know, things? What's the story, guys? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, this is really on thin ice amongst, you know, critical scholars and, and, and actual serious scholarship into uh, ancient history and, uh, and particular biblical criticism. Um, because the, the evidence is overwhelmingly on the other side. Oftentimes, I think to try to make the best uh, argument for, for the skeptic, they say that, uh, okay, so-and-so um, should have mentioned Jesus, and they didn't. And so they'll say, hey, here's some ancient historian that didn't mention Jesus. Um, and Or they'll say that uh, Paul and early Christians really believed in a heavenly or non-corporeal Christ- Jesus, not this Jesus that was actually walking around and talking. It's just it's a, it's a Jesus in their mind. Um, mm-hmm. and they'll, or they'll say that there are no contemporary accounts of Jesus. So we can take each of these in turn. So first is basically an argument from silence. You know, why didn't so-and-so mention Jesus? Um, 
there really is only one, you know, ancient uh, Christian or non-Christian writer, I should say, um, who probably should have mentioned Jesus. As I said earlier, you know, ancient Palestine was on the far edge of the Roman Empire. It was a backwater. It wasn't a place that, um, you know, where the hustle and bustle was for the for Romans. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of interest in there. There were these weird people called the Jews that lived there, um, as far as the pagans were concerned, and you know that was it that they rose up on occasion you know josephus it was a jewish um historian uh who lived uh after after jesus so he writes we, we get a lot of our jewish history from uh josephus uh he lived within i think uh gosh I'm, i don't have states off the top of my head um 50 or 60 years after after jesus and he's writing about some of the events uh that occurred and he mentions him twice you know uh and you know for everybody else that uh, that, that people like to throw out they don't write about obscure religious figures, <laughs> right. you know, which is what Jesus was at the time. He was an obscure religious f- figure on the edge of the empire. Um, not many people are going to have interest in that, uh, and you're not going to get uh, people who, you know, where literacy wasn't widespread, where um, it was expensive and time-consuming and difficult to write. And even if they did, uh, the fact that it would survive 2,000 years later um, is very low. You know, uh, yeah, you're not I, going to get a lot of people mentioning him. Is this right? Is this the way to think about it, or am I? To like framing it in a way that's flattering to our position, it's if, if you, know, you just step back and say if what they want to know is do we have any historical evidence about you know were, were institutions you know talking about him or whatever like yes the entire Western world eventually was based on this guy Jesus mm-hmm. right so the Emperor Constantine certainly we have evidence that he had something to say about you know what I'm saying like so it's is it almost like the skeptics who are talking about this what they mean is if we go back far enough to when like all the major institutions and things weren't talking about Jesus or his legacy and then we get to the period like soon after he was allegedly killed when he still would have been kind of an unknown just a peripheral figure well then everybody wasn't talking about him back when he was a peripheral figure so explain that and he was like you just said he was a peripheral figure so do you get what I'm saying? It's almost right. like because clearly there was a point when he was the most famous person on planet Earth. Yeah, but that happened hundreds of years later, right? R- R- right. If not so thousands say, of years they're, later. They're so. like, why? They want to say, yeah, 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 but go back before he was the most famous person. <laughs> right. And there, there was a point at which he wasn't very well known, mm-hmm. and a yeah. lot of people didn't talk about him. And it was like, okay, because we're saying he was this, you know, carpenter's son that was hanging out with fishermen, and then. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. R- write about Michael. Well, why, why don't we have uh, more evidence about Michael Jordan when he was five? You know, maybe. Uh, you know. Okay. Of yeah, course. Because yeah. nobody's yeah. going to be talking about him at that time. Okay. Right. And then they would say, "Well, we have his yearbook photos, guys. <laughs> Show okay, me well, Jesus. Something. Yeah. Most likely to be best carpenter of Nazareth. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, th- so there's there's that element. Um, yeah, but we do have mentions, you know, of, of Jesus, Josephus. Th- right. That's what I'm saying. You're, yeah. you're pointing. You're saying it's not that there's literally nothing. We do have. So that's what I'm, mm-hmm. I'm getting at. That it, the record is consistent with what you would think because eventually, yeah, everybody's talking about Jesus. Mm-hmm. So, like, what what else would it look like besides in the beginning it was very scant. There was a trickle, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> took over the world. Yeah, it blows up. Yeah, and so you have you have early, um, and, and this is why you know the, the the Jesus mythicist is on is so uh, uh, such a fringe view, <laughs> is that mm-hmm. it's just it, it just doesn't stand up to evidence. And when people actually do some research into it, they realize, oh yeah, it, there there there's quite a bit of evidence. There's quite a bit of reason to to believe. But a lot of the objections um, they just come from a, a position I think of ignorance by and large. I don't mean that to be you know. Uh, offensive or, or besmirching right. of people, but it's right. just you know it, it, it. How many people? Um, I'm, I'm sure many people who are listening to this podcast don't know necessarily who Josephus is. Like that, that might be a new name for a lot of people. So it's not it's not standard reading or discussion about uh, you know some of these ancient historians and so forth. Right. Well, it's not like somebody famous like Tacitus who they have wrote, <laughs> wrote about him. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and, 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 you know, to take the point, you know, Tacitus writes about the founder of the faith. He calls him Crestus and his Christians um, with an E. Uh, yeah. And so, um, but, and that was about 116 AD, 117 AD, I think, when he, when he was writing somewhere in that time period. And, uh, you know, so we do have ancient 
authors who do mention him um, that are that are interested in the time period, but there just aren't a whole lot. You know, it's not like everybody has a has a Instagram or Twitter feed or whatever that they're that we have records of. Um, writing was was by and large rare, and then it has to survive until people yeah, right, can right. That's get the, it. This is a long time ago, yeah. so it's you know not it's not enough that somebody back then wrote about it that would have had to have survived. Yep. So you have other barriers. Mm-hmm. So for the people who say that Paul and early Christians, you know, they didn't hold to a real flesh and blood, blood Jesus, um, again, I think it, it just goes back to reading the writings of, of the gospel writers of Paul and so forth. I mean, we, we, we talked about, we, we referenced 1 Corinthians 15 many times, and uh, there, clearly, Jesus died, he was raised again, he appeared, so forth. This doesn't seem like this is a, some ethereal um, wraith that's, uh, that, that's out there and that uh, Paul is talking about. He also mentions his mother, um, he mentions Mary, he mentions that he was, uh, he was born of a woman, he mentions his, his teachings and so forth. So when you read the epistles, and Paul in particular, like, you, you. Paul's primarily focused on the theology uh, and and fleshing that out and what to do in a lot of these situations. But he has many many references to an actual person named Jesus uh, that come up time and time again. So he's very familiar with his teachings and he's familiar with uh, with what was occurring. And he was interacting with the with the apostles themselves, the other apostles. He goes to Jerusalem as part of what's called the Jerusalem Count, uh, Council um, and consults with them to ensure that he's passing on the the correct uh, gospel and everything else um, that uh, that that he's been taught, um, which he gets as he gets from uh, the Holy Spirit and from Jesus directly. And uh, he says, okay, I, I want to collaborate and make sure that we're all on the same page. And he goes back and he's like, yep, this is right. Got, it got a stamp of approval. Non-heretic, go out and uh, with our blessing. It, it, this one, that's just baffling to me, just to be clear. It's not, the claim here isn't merely that they're saying, oh, when people said they saw Jesus, it was like a vision. They're saying Jesus never was never this phys- historical figure, period. Th- that's what their claim is. That's yeah, so how do we explain that? So, yeah. so to me, I mean, just what, each of the gospel, like they start out with his genealogy and who his mom and dad were. Like, that's just, that's nutty to me that mm-hmm. they, were, they would try to argue. I get people saying he never existed. These books are all made up. But to say, oh, these people, who, the, who they're talking about when they talk about Jesus is this non corporal being like that just seems like a weird move to make yeah and and they typically have to rely on paul's writings for that and mm-hmm. kind of exclude the gospel and basically get rid of whatever paul may have said about you know about james jesus's brother and so forth because um, right. clearly in those instances paul's talking about a real person so it's kind of one right. of those things where if you get rid of all the evidence then you know hey, there's you, no evidence you can yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can make it sound plausible and so uh, the other one that, that we have is um, about uh, contemporary accounts. And so typically this view is, is a little bit different from the ancient historians. It's that, okay, why weren't people writing, you know, right then at that time about what Jesus was up to um, and about who he was and, and what he had happened? Why don't we have anything dated from, you know, 30 AD if he was killed in 33 or 27 if he was killed in 30? There's some disagreement about which, which year, but um, we don't have anything like that. And, and again, this I think is missing a lot of historical context that we don't have uh, accounts of people like Hannibal, for example, that are um, contemporaneous with him. They were written hundreds of years, if not millennia later, for a lot of major historical figures, um, by and large, because writing was was difficult. It, it, it took time. Um, things may have been written down that didn't survive. Uh, but we also have, but we do have some fairly close documents like Paul's letters that were about 10 to 30 years later, uh, depending on who you ask. Uh, scholars will say the Gospels were between 30 and 60 years after they were written. And one thing that's important to note there is that most scholars, when they when they give those dates, they give kind of the upper bound. So it could be it could be earlier. Um, but they'll, they'll usually say 30 to 60 years is like, okay, that's, the, that's as late as it can go. Um, we can't, Gospel of John usually being the 60-year one, and then the other Gospels, Mark, uh, Matthew, Luke, so forth, being about 30 years. Um, they can't go beyond that because, you know, then they run into some weird contradictions within the timeline of when certain things were written and, and occurred. So they'll say, okay, 30 years and 60 years, and that's the upper bound. Uh, but it easily could have been, say, 10, 15, 5 years or so forth. Okay, so again, this is interesting. Like, this is something I didn't know. So, Paul's letters we think were written before the four gospel accounts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's okay. that's the scholarly uh, consensus by and large. 
Um, again, there are arguments for saying, okay, maybe Mark was a bit earlier, or some people take uh, Matthew in priority, so saying Matthew was the first. Mm-hmm. Um, but most say Mark was first. It was the first gospel, but Paul's writings predated those. Um, and those were the earliest ones. So um, Paul had started his ministry after his conversion, shortly after the events that occurred, um, and began to write to the church. And so those were as he was ministering to the churches and as he was spreading the gospel and so forth. Um, and so that's what that's what's by and large believed. Uh, people, uh, Luke traveled with Paul towards the end, um, and we know that uh, through inference, basically because the, the writing changes from third person to first person plural um, in about halfway through Acts, Acts 17, 18, somewhere around there. It suddenly starts to say, we did this, we did that. Um, but um, people believe that, okay, he wrote it you know, much later, like afterwards, so maybe a decade or so later, um, that he actually put all this stuff down. It's just interesting because it's obviously like the timeline, the events of the gospel accounts happened first before the road to Damascus happened. Mm-hmm. But you're saying Paul wrote that stuff down before people chronicled the events that had actually happened or before Paul's letters. Right, yeah. And so scholars will say that you know Mark was written first and then Matthew and uh, Luke used Mark as a source as well as other sources and so forth. And so that's why you have some of the similarities and similar sayings being taken from Mark and so forth. And some of the, uh, the so they'll try to date that and, and, and spread that out. But um, yeah, that's by and large how, how, how they look at it. Okay, great. If just last five minutes, let's say here, if you can, I appreciate your time. This claim that Jesus was a mashup of ancient myths and I've seen I'm sh- every Christmas and every Easter you see these going around on memes on Twitter that like oh it was the you know the winter solstice and then the pagan fertility rituals and worshiping mm-hmm. of the sun and blah 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 and the Christian church is clearly just you know these are you know these are pagan holidays and that so what, what do you say? Yeah, um, I'll send you another good uh, Lutheran satire video on on this one, <laughs> okay. where they they discuss it. Um, so this has been around for a long time. Uh, I think these trace back to um, a 19th century Egyptologist named uh, Gerald Massey, who essentially invented a lot of the stuff whole cloth, uh, or maybe he just didn't understand what he was reading as he was studying Egypt and so forth. He's a very minor figure um, within Egyptology and he but this aspect kind of lives on uh, over time that saying that oh well there were a lot of similarities here that uh, say Osiris was born on December 25th and so that's why Mm -hmm. Jesus is celebrated on December 25th we're really worshiping Osiris or so forth Um, the evidence for this just isn't there uh, this is really a a lot of stuff that's just been invented a hundred I've seen it on several memes yeah, y- y- yeah, I know. It, Multiple it's... attestations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got six memes that say this, all independent. Um, but when you go back to actually the source, it was somebody who essentially was was making a lot of this stuff up, or just didn't know what he was he was talking about, uh, and and he puts it out there, and it got picked up again. Um, there was a movie about fifteen years ago called Zeitgeist. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, but they they have a lot of uh, skepticism of say the IMF and and other organizations. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and stuff. yeah, I've seen that. Mm. Yeah, and, and in it they they talk about uh, Christianity and they bring up a lot of these different um, myths and say that these were all similar. Um, when you actually get into it though, they just they just there's nothing there. There's no there there. Uh, so I think it was uh, Horus is one of the people that, uh, or one of the Egyptian gods that say, oh, well, we got this from from, Christi- from Christianity. Uh, when you actually look at it, um, they say, oh, he was born of a virgin, but the actual Horus myths uh, that we have say that, oh, that's not true at all. He was born in some weird, like, some weird, uh, not to get graphic, um, intercourse in the womb like you know these ancient myths are can be very very bizarre and then uh there was some um castration that occurred and then uh that impregnated uh his mother and so forth and it's uh it's strange to say that he was born of a virgin uh, i don't know how you get there okay so the horace origin story involved an actual intercourse of some sort (laughs) yeah so it was not the normal procedure by which impregnation would occur but it's kind of stretching it to say, oh, it was a virgin birth, and that's clearly where the Christians stole that idea from. Right, right. Okay. Uh, or same with Mithras, which is thrown out there a lot. Mithras was, like, uh, born from a rock. I think this is also mentioned in Zeitgeist as well. And um, it's been a long time since I saw the, the film. But it, uh, 
uh, and then hey, that's where we got the got the virgin birth from. So when you actually like start to look at a number of these things, uh, they talk about crucifixion of these of the Egyptian gods, but this they um, apparently these Egyptian gods were uh, pro- believed in, or um, the myths were written in, and. Uh, uh, recorded long before crucifixion was invented, so I don't know how how you can get by with that. Um, you know, it, it's just a number of things that they don't match with the timeline. There's no um, uh, the myths just don't hold up at all when you actually scrutinize them, and there's no evidence that these Jewish uh, early Christian believers <laughs> were influenced by Egyptian pagan myths. Uh, there's, you've got to think back to to the beginnings of Christianity and who it was going to. They were they were very set in a very strict um, Jewish faith and milieu, and then and there's no evidence of this kind of Egyptology coming in and and corrupting their faith and their belief or having any sort of exposure to it whatsoever. Right, and at least as far as like the timing of Easter, I mean that was because of what that's when Passover was. You're right. Right, you mean so like it would have to be like the Jews when they picked when Passover was were looking ahead to know we're going to want to have a fertility ritual to celebrate right. this thing called Christianity down the road, and that you know so that's kind of a weird. Yeah, exactly. We we get that date from from Passover because the Passion yeah. story for for Jesus's death and resurrection occurred during the Passover week, so that's why. You know, it, it coincides, and that happened to be in the spring, and that coincides with a lot of pagan fertility uh, cults and so forth, because spring it represents rebirth, and and uh, you know we're coming out of uh, out of winter, and everything's you know coming back to life. Um, it's just coincidence that those would happen to line up. There's no real historical evidence behind that. And I mean, is there, in fairness to the, what am I trying to say? So clearly, you're saying a lot of the strict allegations about this is where the you know the Christian myth was drawn from from earlier sources. You can see the similarity. You're saying a lot of those. No, when you actually go investigate them, either they're just making it up, or when you read the source, it's like yeah, there's a vague resemblance, but it's really not. You know, you wouldn't call it plagiarism if a student took that you know wrote one story. You wouldn't mm-hmm. say he ripped off somebody else's idea. But is there anything like? Like the Easter Bunny, stuff like that. Like, is that loosely based on some, you know, fertility thing of pagans worshiping the crops coming in or something? I mean, with some of those symbols, um, I'd have to go and look into each of those. But that, even if, even if say some of the uh, the what are we looking for the accoutrements around the holidays, Christmas trees and and Easter bunnies yeah, and so that's forth. That's what I'm getting at. Like, yeah. is there any? In other words, some of the similarities people are saying, oh, and this was borrowed from this tradition or whatever, and the holidays kind of merged. Th- that doesn't affect the truth of Christianity. Exactly. But I'm, I'm saying, are you open to, yeah, maybe there is some kind of overlap and borrowing of cultures and mixing, but but no, in terms of like the, the, the core tenets of Christianity, that there's no evidence. In John 27, up. therefore the Easter bunny shall come. No. Um <laughs> I mean, yeah. It, it, if some of this stuff is borrowed, I really don't know because it's never just been one of those things that's bothered me. Like, where do we get a Christmas right. tree? I've heard that it comes from Norse mythology or Easter bunnies from these um, other pagan myths. I'm not too concerned with it because it doesn't affect the resurrection. It doesn't affect the truth of Christianity. There's no biblical evidence for it uh, that, that there's right. an Easter bunny or, or the early Christians uh, didn't uh, celebrate Easter with rabbits. As far as I'm as far as I'm aware, um, having read a lot of that literature, I haven't come across it. Um, but yeah, it, it's one of those things where it just becomes kind of a periphery. Okay, so what if maybe at one point this was adopted in as part of the the ritual, and maybe it does uh, kind of secularize it or, or paganize it slightly? It doesn't. We can we can remove that and still hold to the core historical narratives and, and truth of Jesus's resurrection. Right, and in fairness, it's not like a church you pass around the elements of communion and then give some Easter eggs and go color them or something. You know, like it's right. You you might at worst have kids in in Sunday school like the you know little kids like like maybe they're coloring in something that might have eggs or something on yeah. it but even there it's it's not really like the church per se is saying now Easter Bunny is the thing to associate with what <laughs> what's Good Friday about it's about bunnies like that that doesn't happen so. right right yeah now we worship the Easter Bunny today and then you know Jesus <laughs> later yeah it's 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 it's, it's periphery, which is why I've never really cared to look into it myself, right. and so I don't have a great answer for where those came from, because it's just never been, I'm like, okay, whatever, people have fun yeah, with I w- it. <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to gauge how strongly you were going to say that, no, there's no, conne- that, strictly speaking, what you're arguing is that the major things talking about the story of Jesus and his death and resurrection, 
to allegations that, or, or his virgin birth, things like that, that the gospel accounts of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, you're saying there's no, it's not like there's a pre-existing pagan mythology where all those elements are taken from that. So yeah. that, that's what you're talking about. Right. And, and, and even if there was, that would still be another twist on the conspiracy theory to say, oh, hey, we have these parallels that, that line up here. Right. Um, then you have to posit that the apostles knew about them, that they wrote stories drawing on those or were inspired by those and then went to go propagate what they knew to be a lie and so forth. So you get right back into the conspiracy theory, ter- theory territory. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, Thank you very much. I guess last question is if somebody wants to know more on this, I'm kind of putting you in the spot here. Is there like, like if somebody says, is there like one book I can read that summarizes this stuff? Um, it depends on how book, big of a book you want. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, you've, you've got some, uh, some, some good scholarly work. I don't really know a whole lot of good popular level stuff. Um, I would say Reasonable Faith by William Lane Craig, the last chapter deals with a lot of this stuff. Um, and he goes through the history of the arguments and kind of where it came from, going back to the Enlightenment and so forth, and and uh, and then brings it uh, to to through modern textual criticism. Um, that gives you a good start. Um, he actually has another book called On Guard, which might be a, a, a better place for people to begin. So yeah, On Guard um, okay. would be probably the place to go to to, to deal um, with the resurrection and there's there's and other arguments for for Christian belief and and uh, and the existence of God. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much, uh, folks. My guest this week has been Christian Hubs. Christian, thanks so much for your time. Yeah, appreciate it, Bob. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit bobmurphyshow.com.